God moves into the human neighborhood to make his rule and his reign most abundant and clear to us as human beings. So I'm embarrassed to tell you this story, but when I was in high school, we had a teacher that many of us as students didn't show a lot of respect for. My high school is very similar to how every high school in the world would be. There was a principal who was in charge of everything, but that principal wasn't hanging out in every classroom throughout the day all the time. And so we had a teacher, a teacher in geometry class, who was a little meek, and we as students took advantage of her. So I'll tell you a few examples. I had a buddy who, back before cell phones, because I have gray hair and I'm getting a little older, had a fart machine. Now, I don't know if you know what a fart machine is, but it was this little plastic device that had one recording on it, and it was the sound of a fart. And he would sit in the back of the classroom, and he would have this in his pocket, and when he pressed a button, it would make a very large sound that sounded like a fart. Okay? So you can imagine what would happen in that class is everybody would start laughing, and everybody would start looking around like, ha-ha, they did that, they did that, they did that. And the teacher was left up there pretty helpless. And we would do this day after day. It wasn't very kind. My friend would do this. My, there was another student in class that one day pretended uh, that he passed out in the class during geometry and bounced up against the window, and the window actually broke in her class. She also had a rule that you weren't allowed to throw anything in class, and the budding lawyer that I was wanted to understand the definition of what it meant to throw. And so I realized the first day that if I just stood over the trash can and dropped a piece of paper into it, that that wasn't throwing. And so if I took one step back, that didn't count as throwing. But there was a point, about five or six feet, if you're curious, where it counted as throwing, and I was removed from the class and sent to the principal's office. So I'm just giving you a taste. This is kind of confession. We were not good students. We're not kind to this teacher. The principal was in charge of the building. One day, after the principal heard of all these antics that were happening in the classroom day after day, the principal showed up in the classroom and hung out with us during the class period. So how much disruption do you imagine happened when the principal showed up? Not much. So there's the, the difference between the authority, the power that a principal has in law versus in fact when they show up. Okay, So this is what we're imagining. We understand theologically that God is in, in control, but then one day God comes and puts on flesh in Jesus and dwelt amongst the people and made his reign, his power, his authority much more clear. So what does this look like? What does the kingdom of God look like? Well, when Jesus comes and he's reigning on earth, he's inviting people to be a part of his people. To step into and live into this kingdom. So let's read how Jesus describes this. So this is Matthew chapter 13. We're, gonna read, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to hone in on a few sections. Starting in verse 31. So Matthew 13, 31, if you want to follow along. It says he gave them another parable. So he's been telling lots of stories. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest garden plant and becomes a tree so that the wild birds come and nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of flour until all the dough had risen. And then jumping ahead to verse 44. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that a person found and hid. Then because of joy he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found a pearl of great value, he went out and sold everything he had and bought it. Again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea that caught all kinds of fish. 
When it was full, they pulled it ashore, sat down, and put the good fish into containers and threw the bad away. It will be this way at the end of the age. Angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They replied, yes. Then he said to them, therefore, every expert in the law who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and old. All right, so let's talk about each of these individually. And I'll end with the example that's the hardest, which is the end, where we get that strong language where he talks about the gnashing of teeth and the throwing into fiery furnace, which is scary language for us. But the image that Jesus is giving us is of this reign, this rule of God. And typically when we think of heaven or the kingdom of heaven, most of us immediately have this image in our mind of some heavenly sphere, some space where people are floating around on clouds. It's very spiritual. Someone's playing a harp over in the corner. When we see paintings or images of heaven, that's typically what we imagine, right? If I were to ask you what heaven's like, you're immediately going to think we're up in the air somewhere and that it's the best furniture in the world because they look like clouds and they feel like clouds. Well, that's not the imagery that Jesus gives us when he talks about heaven. When Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about a new reality. And the image that I think is much more helpful for us to think about and the image that I think God points us to is not this cloudy vision, but goes back to Genesis in the very beginning of the Bible where we have the image of everything being perfect in the Garden of Eden. And what Jesus is saying is all this messiness, all this brokenness that we're experiencing in this world, hatred, disease, death, war, backfighting, all the stuff that when we talk about our world that we don't like, Jesus is saying he's come into the world to recreate, to restore that brokenness, and to make the world more like it was at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 2. Well, what was that world like? Well, when you planted things into the ground in your garden, or you planted crops, there were no weeds competing for nourishment. Everything that we planted was abundant. That human beings didn't and weren't passive-aggressive towards one another. There wasn't all this hate and animosity. It wasn't a struggle with our own self-consciousness to, to be in community with other people. But relationships came easy and natural, and we trusted one another, and we could believe that the other had our best interests in mind, and love was the reality, not hate and discord. Jesus gives us this image that even the lions... The strongest of beasts in God's creation would lay down next to the lambs. These meek and weak perception of creatures. So when we think to ourselves, if there was a perfect world, what would that world be like? And all those things come to mind very practically. Then my relationships with my family would be wonderful. My relationship with my neighbor would be free of all that baggage. That those people that I love that have disease, that that wouldn't even exist, it wouldn't even be a consideration, that death wouldn't be a part of our news or our reality. All that stuff that's very practical and real, that's what Jesus is talking about, restoring and making new and returning us back to the reality of the beginning of Genesis. Doesn't that sound good? Do you see why we talk about the gospel as good news? It's not this over-spiritualized, detached-from-reality thing. It is very much speaking directly to our human experience. And so that's why when Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, he's not just saying to them, or not saying to them, go, it's going to be wonderful, you're going to be on a cloud. What does he do? He goes and finds someone that has disease and he puts their, his hand on them and that disease goes away. He goes and finds people that are suffering and he shows them 
by his actions what the kingdom of God is going to be like where that is no longer reality. And so to that truth, to that vision of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, he gives us some examples. He says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Now, most of us have probably seen a mustard seed. A mustard seed is tiny. It's smaller than a popcorn kernel. Much, much smaller. Tiny, tiny, tiny. He says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like that. And that tiny little mustard seed, when you stick it down into the soil, eventually becomes this big mustard plant, like a tree, that becomes so big that even birds can come and make their nest on it. He says the kingdom of heaven is like that. That these tiny little actions, these tiny little things that Jesus does, and ultimately what we do as citizens of this kingdom of heaven do, can have unbelievably large consequences. I even think about how Dana and I ended up in Quincy in West Central Illinois again that obviously you know that I took a job with the Trace Family Foundation, but that began, that whole process began, because my cousin who lives in Mount Sterling just texted me a picture of the job description. And I still remember receiving that text and laughing and saying, ha ha, no way, I I love what I'm doing as a pastor, I have no interest, I love, we love being in West Lafayette, Indiana. It just wasn't anything I was interested in, but in the way that God sometimes works, God just kept pestering me, and it kept coming to mind, and so I sent a, a, I made a phone call to someone that was on the board, and it turned into an application, and you know, all those years ago, now we have been here for six years, but it began with that small little text that seemed really insignificant, and in the same way, if you walk into the grocery store, and you smile at the clerk, or you tell them, have a great day, or you send a note of encouragement to someone, just because you felt like you should? It's unbelievable how cascading that effect of good can have in our world. And that's what Jesus is saying about the kingdom of heaven. When those of us that follow him take the step to introduce into the world something that is a part of that movement, it may seem tiny and insignificant, But he's promising us that it grows. It grows and it grows and it grows into these enormous movements that have an impact not just on people, but communities. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Then he says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. So the illustration of a mustard seed is it's going to feel really small and insignificant. But he's promising us that it blows up, it grows. The introduction of this illustration of yeast works a little differently. It's really small too. You know when you open up a yeast packet, it too is really small kernels. But what does he say about the yeast? He says the yeast is like the kingdom of heaven. A woman takes it, mixes it with three measures of flour until all the dough has risen. Now, Three measures of flour is a boatload of flour. We don't usually talk about measures, but some translations say 60 pounds. Okay? Yeast packets, you know, you've gotten them at the grocery store. There's not that much yeast. Certainly doesn't weigh anything close to 60 pounds. But how does yeast work? It doesn't take very much. You mix a little yeast into a lot of flour... And then the way that yeast works, it mixes in, and the whole batch, it's enough for the whole batch to rise. Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. You work a little bit of encouragement into a community of people. You work a little bit of kindness, a little bit of forgiveness, a little bit of patience into a community of people, and it will grow. It'll work its way all the way through the batch. Jesus is introducing himself to just a few people. Jesus didn't come to earth and say, I'm going to gather a million, millions, and billions of people to myself 
And I'm going to spend time with billions of people, and that's how my gospel is going to go forward. What did he do? He said, I'm going to gather 12, 12 folks. I'm not even going to pick the smartest or the brightest folks. I'm going to gather a few fishermen that never have studied any theology in all their life. I'm going to get a tax collector, a guy no one really likes at all. And I'm going to spend a lot of time with those folks. That's how my gospel is going to go to the ends of the world. If you, had, you and I had seen that in an ancient strategic plan, we would have laughed. Right? We would have said that's the most ridiculous thing everybody's, anyone's ever put as a strategy in a strategic plan. That you're going to invest in 12 people and that somehow is going to go to the ends of the world. And in 2023, there's going to be 100 people in a church building in Quincy, Illinois, and they're going to be worshiping that same God would have sounded ludicrous. And yet that's exactly what Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like. It's going to feel small. It's going to feel like the kindness that you extend to a, a stranger is insignificant and makes no difference in the world. You're going to feel like you need a crowd of thousands of people. That you need to be president of a country. That you need to be the boss at your business to feel like you can make a difference not true that God takes small things and they work them way work their way all the way through the batch and what feels insignificant to us but is a step towards being more like Christ has eternal consequences eternal effects on everything around us we know small things work their way through the batch you know, a few years ago, there was this tiny little virus maybe you've heard of called COVID. Started somewhere in the world. We're still trying to figure that out. Seems small and consequential. And after a period of time, it was infecting people all over the world. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God, the way that his good mission his work of restoration can go out is like that. It's viral. And it has, in the sense that in 2023, here we are, worshiping that God. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. It's like a treasure hidden in a field that a person found and hid. Then, because of joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he found a pearl of great value, he went out and sold everything he had to buy it. It's like a hidden treasure. It's like a pearl that is so valuable that once you find it, you would be willing to sell everything, give up everything you have for it. He's telling us here that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is so vital that for those of us that recognize how wonderful it is we give up everything else in order to have that thing. The final illustration he gives us is of a net. And this is, I think, it sounds like more applicable to the sermon that was on hell than this passage. But Jesus is telling us, here he says, the kingdom of God is like a net. It was cast into the sea that caught all kinds of fish. Jesus is helping us to see that his goal in coming, was to bring all people to himself. But he also recognizes that not all people will respond to this message that he's giving. And it says, when it was full, the net is full, they pulled it ashore, sat down, and the good fish, put the good fish into containers and threw the bat away. This is what fishermen would do in the ancient world. They'd catch fish, you know, in your net, the net can't discern the good fish from the bad fish. So they're all going to get captured in the net, but they'd pull that net in, they'd go to shore, and they would take all the good fish that were valuable, they'd take them to the market and sell them. All the bad fish, they're just discarding, getting rid of, because they know they aren't valuable enough for anybody to pay anything for. And he's saying it'll be like that, that God's going to go through people. And remember, his ultimate goal is to recreate to restore us back to Genesis 1 and 2. And so in order to do that, what God is doing is capturing the people that want to be a part of that vision. 
that see Jesus as the path through which we can live into that vision. And so he says there's a separation. He takes the people that want to be a part of that vision, and they become a part of it through Christ, through faith, through confession. But those people that don't want to be a part of it are not. They receive what it is that they desired, what they wished. And he says that those that do not want to be a part of this vision will remain in many ways a part of the same vision that is our earthly reality now. Death and disease and destruction. If they prefer to be in that reality, then God honors their wish and their commitment. And then he asks those listening to him, have you understood all these things? And his hearers say, yes. Then he says, therefore, every expert in the law who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his treasure what is new and what is old. He wants people to see what the kingdom of heaven is, and he wants them to be a part of that vision as citizens. So in our remaining minutes, I want to talk about what this practically looks like. And so a kingdom, what does a kingdom have? A kingdom has a king. A kingdom has a people. A kingdom has a land. And a kingdom has a set of guidelines. Now, as Americans, many of us are Americans. Most of us are probably Americans. We kind of like democracies. <laughs> we like the ability to elect someone. And then often in democracies, certainly in our own, we value freedom. And that freedom kind of gives us the ability to say, yeah, we didn't vote for that person. <laughs> we didn't vote for that man or that woman. And so, yeah, they're our elected leader, but I don't really like them. Kingdoms don't work that way. A kingdom works where there is a supreme leader. In our case, when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, it's Jesus. You know, we have, there's two flags in this sanctuary. One is a, a Christian flag, and one is an American flag. When I was in Ecuador, there was no one that we were worshiping Jesus with that was going to pledge allegiance to the American flag. It wasn't that they disliked Americans. It just was that they pledged allegiance to the Ecuadorian flag and were proud to be Ecuadorian. And what's power about the gospel of Jesus is that our primary allegiance is to King Jesus. We can be proud to be an American, but our commitment to our nation is a step below our commitment to the kingdom and Jesus. And that's why I can take my girls to Ecuador and we can worship Jesus and God right alongside of people that are part of a different nation. Because we look at all these different countries of the world and we realize our primary allegiance is to Jesus. So the kingdom of heaven has a king and that king is Jesus. The kingdom of heaven has a people that's you and I, the church. The church isn't this building. The church across all nations, across the world, is made up of people that confess faith that Jesus is Savior and Lord and commit to following him. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. We submit ourselves to King Jesus. The kingdom of heaven has a land. The United States has a land. It has borders. We know where those borders are at. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, covers all the earth. God's rule, God's reign, is earth and everything that can be imagined in all eternity. The kingdom of heaven has a set of guidelines. God gives us in his word instructions how it is we ought to live our life. I've named a few of those already. Patience, kindness, Love, even for our enemies. Self-control. God gives us guides for what his people ought to live into as citizens of his kingdom. So the next and final slide. If every kingdom has these things, then it's important for us to recognize that every kingdom citizen has these things. You and I have a king. King Jesus. That means that we are a part of a kingdom that is not a democracy. I mean, we're certainly a part of a democracy in the United States, but as a part of the kingdom of heaven, we submit entirely to a perfect, wonderful, glorious king who knows far more and far better than we do. 
and we're a part of a people. That we're not the only one that submits to this king, but there are other people in our life that are trying to submit to that king as well. And so we turn to them for encouragement and refinement and growth. We're part of a land. We're part of a people. The reality is that you and I are closer to our brothers and sisters in Christ that are Ecuadorian or Chinese or Iraqi or Iranian that follow Jesus, that are citizens of the same kingdom, than we are Americans that don't. There is a land that surpasses what is familiar to us. And there is a set of guidelines. If we're going to be a member of this kingdom of heaven, then we submit to Jesus as Lord, as boss, as master of our life, and as Savior, the one that rescues us from this world that we are so frustrated with many times, that we believe a God is restoring and making new these broken things around us, and that you and I are a part of making those things new. We're not just checking a ticket to go to the cloudy heaven. You and I, if we are followers of Jesus, our neighbors, the clerk at the grocery store, the waiter or waitress that waits on us at the restaurant, our co-workers, our family members that frustrate us, they are the audience through which we practice being Christ-like. We practice being as Jesus would be to them. That is what it means to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. May we together as God's people, as members of the church of Jesus Christ, practice that together. Not perfect it together, practice it together. May that be our goal. May that be preeminent to any other club or country that we may believe we're a part of. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for these illustrations because sometimes our mind is small and it's hard to wrap our mind around these big concepts, but you give us the example of a mustard seed. And so when we feel like it's no big deal if, if we smile at the clerk or say thank you, or we feel like it's no big deal to write a, a note of encouragement to someone or to compliment them or to be patient, Father, remind us that those small things, though they may feel insignificant, or how your movement moves across this earth, across this world, so that might, more people might join your kingdom and understand you as Savior and Lord. In all things we pray in your name. Amen.